in that car ride, I said, you know, if there is Islamophobia, then we should also be doing this same kind of work to expose Hinduphobia. And then I looked up online, I did a quick search, and the, the Islamophobia had tens of thousands of hits. People writing about it, arguing about it, uh, it was a topic of conversation. And Hinduphobia got zero hits. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start using this term. Saying his theory is that Ramayan, Ramayan is the template on how you fight the uh, foreign enemy, which is, which is uh, Ravan, because he's Sri Lanka, he's outside India. So it, is, it shows God is a role model to fight the foreign enemy. God himself is doing it. And, and therefore, the, this Ramayan became the template, according to him, uh, to fight uh, Muslims because they're foreign. So Ramayan is anti-Islam because it gives you the code, the secret code, how to go, how, to, how, Rama, how Ravan fought, uh, how Ra Lord Ram fought Ravan is how we are supposed to fight the Muslims because they are foreign people. And this is why this whole Ayodhya being Ram is important. This, are th this is a theory this guy has, you know, that Ramayan is the, is the device for, anti, for Islamophobia. And then Mahabharat is not a battle with foreign people, but battle internally within the family, the Kauravs and the Pandavs. And so he says, Mahabharat gives you the code this, the, how to fight Dalits because they're in the family, they're within. So fighting those who came from outside is Ramayan and fighting those who came uh, who are from within is Mahabharat. So he looks for Krishna and whatever is going on, he looks for some Dalit evidence and he says that this is where they get their knowledge from. These people are such twisted people. The book goes through seven periods of Indian history from early Vedic, late Vedic and Itihasic the Dharma Shastra stage, the Muslim rule, European colonial rule, post-independence, and the globalization era. And then there are temples. I'm quite disappointed that the temples are only protecting themselves. And they are not even doing a good job of that. <laughs> Basically, a temple says that uh, if I'm not in trouble, then I better not rock the boat. I don't want to stick my neck out. They'll come after me. Maybe it's better they go after that other fellow. And leave me alone. You know, it's almost like that. And I, I have had to, I have, uh, I've had the pleasure of sticking my neck out and defending ISKCON in the United States, Chinmaya Mission. And I was telling it to the representative of ISKCON to this morning and the representative of Chinmaya Mission and BAPS. And rep this was right in the BAPS temple. So we need something of that sort. And then you need, you need a speaker's forum and you need a, a legal forum. You need certain for type of forums that go across the boundaries of different temples and different organizations. All Hindus should be able to get the benefit and participate in a Hindu legal forum, in a Hindu speakers forum, media forum. So many years ago, where are the Pandavs? Where are the Pandavs? We need, we need the Pandavs there. So we need that kind of a, a individual right now. And how to get Pandavs? You know, Dronacharya was the major big teacher. So Dronacharya was an amazing teacher. He taught all these guys. He taught both sides. And so we need the Dronacharya to produce these people. So I created this thing called uh, uh, Diksha Academy. Dharma, Dronacharya, D can stand for Dharma or Dronacharya, Intellectual Kshatriya Academy. D-I-K-S-H-A. And so I floated this. And I said, you support it, put it together. I, I don't need to own anything, but I'll be a mentor. And so if in the UK or wherever some people have want to create a Diksha uh, Academy to create the future, to be the mentors, to create the future uh, Pandavs in the next generation. So those are the leaders. Then I'm very happy to devote everything I, I'm capable of to join this process.
Namaste. I'm delighted to be here. It's been quite a few years. Uh, I was also here before the COVID. Some of the persons sitting in the back were responsible for that visit, which I cherished a lot. Uh, so I'm delighted. I've been wanting to come back. I used to come to England in the 1980s uh, as a consultant to uh, Margaret Thatcher's British Telecom, which had just been privatized. So I had a, that was one of the things I was doing. I want to talk about how I got into this because people want to know how did you get into this mess? My, many of my friends said, you know, you were doing so well. We thought you would retire on an island somewhere and enjoy life and all that. And rather than doing that, uh, you got into from the frying pan into the fire from one kind of a commitment to run around to another one. Actually, I work more hours a day, more days a week than I did when I was making money. And now I'm doing it, giving back. But it's more fun. So uh, there is that kshatriya in me. There is that uh, scientific uh, analytical training. Uh, and there is that uh, business corporate, you know, uh, the project management, efficiency, results oriented. You put all that together. Many of you have these qualities. Uh, it's just a matter of if you were to put aside everything you're doing and not as a hobby only, weekends and once in a while, but as a full time thing, if this is what you wanted to do, I, I'm convinced that such a large number of people from our community would become among the best scholars of our tradition and beat the hell out of these, the Western Indologists and Hindu phobic people. It's just that they have put a whole lot of hard work into it and we have it. And the people who are very successful uh, have the brains, have the, uh, you know, the mental training uh, to do this, uh, haven't really joined this. They have, they are more into their own success, which is fine. I mean, that's their choice. But my story started with taking all the training uh, in other fields, in physics, computer science, in business, in, uh, you know, uh, running, uh, doing consultancies, coming up with strategies, figuring out competitive analysis. The first thing I did was I applied the methodology of competitive analysis, industry analysis, to analyze Hinduism studies as an industry. India studies as an industry. You know, many years later, I had a meeting with uh, Rajat Gupta. He was the head of McKinsey. Uh, the reason I had this meeting uh, at that time is because uh, uh, McKinsey was going around India promoting that they should invest in South Asian studies in Harvard and South Asian studies in various places. So I asked him the following question. I said that uh, when McKinsey advises a client to invest in an industry, so let's say you take a client and you want them to be in the hotel industry or tech industry or pharma industry. Don't you do an industry analysis? And he said, of course, we always require that. I said, so have you done an industry analysis on India studies before you went and asked all these clients to invest millions of dollars? And he was stunned. He had never thought of it that way. And I said, India, the study of India is an industry. There are people who do it full time. There are, there's money being spent. There are products created. Uh, there are people with agendas. There is market share. Uh, there is there, all of that that happens in an industry happens here. And he, he hadn't thought of it that way, which is kind of surprising. So I said, can you tell me how many uh, people in the United States are full time researchers on India? I'm not talking about hobby people. I'm not talking about somebody who writes an article once in a while. I'm talking about a professor of philosophy in India, religion in India, anthropology in India, social sciences in, about India, history or political science or any of these domains. If it is specializing in India, how many such people are there? And he had no clue. So I told him that my foundation does an annual analysis. We do a scan. In those days, it was not easy to do computer searches. So we did labor intensive work. I would hire uh, graduates, uh, graduates from Princeton University during the summer. It was a good internship for them. And we would scan dissertations that came uh, on India, every kind of dissertation. We would scan proceedings of conferences. There's one in, uh, one in Wisconsin, one in Michigan, one in Berkeley in those days. And we would scan for, I still have those, for 20 years of 25 years of uh, conferences on India, we scanned. And since there was no automatic search, we had to hire students to go through, look for patterns and look for keywords. So whenever something is about caste, we would set it aside and analyze it. Or whenever something was about sati 
or whenever something about Aryan. So we would scan. So we would look for markers that needed further study. And so based on that, we would put out a report on who studies India, how they study India, what is the methodology, what are their conclusions, who is for, who is against, why, what their agenda is, who funds them. So this is called an industry report. So I told this to Rajat Gupta and he was very impressed. And I said, you know, if I were you, before going, before a, a consulting company going to Reliance and all these people and asking them to invest uh, in an industry, because this is an industry, and you ought to know about that industry and you don't know the, about, your, about the industry. So you are investing because they're nice guys, because this professor is good, this faculty is good, it's well known. So I said, would you ever ask an investor to invest in a certain company because those people are good guys and they seem nice guys. And when you go there, they treat you well. And it, the hearsay rumor is that they're good people. You wouldn't do that. You would look at the substance of what they're doing. What I call Purva Paksha, an analysis, an industry analysis or an analysis of a particular institution or a particular individual. So that is the kind of work we did for a long time. And the reason I got into this work is that when I started the foundation, I had no clue of what I'd later discovered as Hindu phobia. I had no clue. So I want to tell you how it, it happened, how it discovered it. We started out by saying that uh, the, 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 the in, uh, foundation will give grants in two categories, wisdom areas where we spread wisdom for humanity and compassion. Compassion is easy to do funding in, you know, give food to people. Uh, there was the AIDS crisis in those days, help those out, uh, give education, uh, things of uh, charity, the normal philanthropy, the normal charity, which is not controversial at all. We started with a certain amount of grant giving in that area and the rest of it would be wisdom, knowledge. So my interest was more wisdom because I could bring my own ideas, my philosophy, my, you know, I could add value. So we gradually did less and less of the compassion, put more and more into wisdom. And the wisdom projects were, I, I, we started a project in Columbia University to teach Indian philosophy. And the strange thing is there was a, such a, it was such a big uh, problem to get them to, they took the money, but they, they couldn't find out, they couldn't decide how to teach, who will teach, because I wanted a certain standard. I wanted, uh, you know, the value of Indian uh, philosophy, not as a anthropological or a kind of a slanderous approach, and they didn't have anybody. And then finally, I found the head of Buddhism and he said, I'll put it through. And that's how we got it started. So I had one experience after another. I had experiences in um, Harvard. We were, for three years in a row, uh, we, we funded the Indology Conference at Harvard, which we actually were the main reason they started that conference. And the Indology Conference was a study of uh, Indology, what they called. And they br would bring in, with our money, they would bring in scholars from India, Pakistan, uh, Nepal, Afghanistan, Iran, Europe, different places, people who, were, who had something special in the field of Indology, and they were looking at the Indus civilization, the, the script issue and the linguistic issue and all of the different types of data to try and con construct a thesis. And that is where I realized that they are actually using my money to construct something which is actually wrong. And, and because their idea was that this rich guy will give us money and we'll take photo ops and most Indians are like that only, and we'll just superficially treat him while, well, and uh, send him back home and he'll be happy and we, he really won't mess with the subject matter. But I am not interested in that. I would sit in the front row and I would raise my hand all the time and I would raise questions. And it would be very embarrassing of them be, as the main donor uh, for them to ignore me. So they had to take on me, take me on and I would really go for it. Uh, in those days, we didn't have videos and cameras and all that. I'm talking about 30 years ago. So I became a sort of a troublemaker. So they would write to me saying, you know, Infinity Foundation is the greatest and the only funding source we have, but Rajiv Malhotra is not uh, easy to deal with. So we, we would like the funding, but we don't like the, in, uh, sub, you know, all this uh, messing around with us. And I said, this messing around with us is the reason why I gave up all my, my whole career is to mess around with this. This is what I want to do. I enjoy doing this. And even when I was a tech entrepreneur, uh, as the owner of companies, I would roll up my sleeves and get involved in the nitty gritty engineering and software and design and architecture. That's what I enjoy. So here I'm tinkering because that's what I enjoy doing. And you're not going to get rid of me that way. So we did, we had quite a lot of encounters. I really discovered how they operate. What are the key issues? You see, 
discovering the problem itself, discovering the disease, being able to do the pathology of that disease, how that disease operates is half the problem. You cannot cure until you've got a good diagnosis of how this thing operates. What is the mechanism by which this thing operates? Why is it so? Who is behind it? What's in it for them? Why are these guys all spending so many decades of their life in India? These anthropologists go to villages and they gather data and they live in all these conditions. It's very hot and there are snakes and there's monsoons and they write, they're bothered by all this. They go to the most difficult terrain in India and they live there with these villagers and they come back and they write their stuff. Why are they doing it? I really wanted to know that. So my work is not based on copy paste some report from here, report from there and say, oh, I've discovered Hinduphobia or anything. It's not like that. It's rolling up my sleeve. I would go with these people. If I'm funding, I'd like to hop on the plane. I'll go with you guys and we'll go to Nagapatinam village in, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu where there's a lot of conversion going on. You want to interview those people. I also want to watch and see what, what's going on. So I was there when they're traveling into Rajasthan, when they're going into this village, that village. Uh, so I would, I would follow follow them uh, and do my own independent uh, response to their dissertations. There was hardly a dissertation concerning Hinduism and India its traditions during those years that I did not read. And by read, I mean really read it. So I was reading whatever publications would come out and whatever journals there were. Uh, and and uh, so I became very knowledgeable and uh, they would be very surprised. This guy knows a lot. He's, he's well read. You know, and uh, because many of them are not so well read, they're very narrow in a particular topic. So some, uh, you know, buddy Anne Gold, Professor Anne Gold became famous as an anthropologist because she went to the same village uh, in uh, uh, Ghatiali village or something like that in Rajasthan for 20 years every year and studied them over and over again. But her knowledge would not be in, in anywhere else. And nor would she know ancient history, nor would she know about language. So their knowledge tends to be very narrow. And because in a narrow field, there tend to be very few experts, there's nobody to challenge them. So what happens is there are lots of topics in India because India is so vast, so diverse. There are so many topics of study. Each topic has just one or two or three ultra specialized people and they are taken as the gospel and they all quote each other. If I want to, if I want to a reference on your topic, I'll just quote you and you want to refer to something where I'm specializing, you quote me and we all become experts. It's like an echo chamber. So I realized how this whole thing is going and nobody's challenging it properly. So I came up in the one of the American Academy of Religion conferences. They invited me uh, and I gave a talk uh, uh, and this, this is available. All these are available online in various places. Um, we are trying to consolidate and publish them, these old things. In that, I offered a challenge. Uh, the the uh, Gulf War was going on, the first Gulf War. And CNN was doing something which had never been done before. They were doing live, live from the scene, war scene. So they would, they would have a reporter in the battlefield reporting. And this was for the first time that American audiences could see on the screen, one, one half of the screen would be somebody in the United States uh, interviewing and the other half of the screen was somebody on the battlefield responding. And they had this live two-way thing going. And this was considered a very, very big breakthrough. Uh, because it was not internet in those days and there was, it was not uh, video uh, conferencing like we have, but a lot of uh, expensive gadgetry. So what I offered these people at the American Academy of Religion is I'll set up one of these uh, systems in the villages in India where you guys are researching and we will have you uh, talking and we'll have the villager responding and I'll have an interpreter translating from their language. So whatever papers you're presenting on a particular community in India, that community will be listening and talking back. That community will get to, will get to say whether you got it right or whether you got it wrong. Because obviously, if I were writing about you guys, some white people, you would be answering me. You would not just take it. But in your case, you study a village and they never know what you published. They never know what you published. You don't share it with them. You don't give them a chance to talk back. You don't give them that chance. And that is unethical. So they were, there was a huge hue and cry that this guy is now wanting to challenge the field of uh, social science research. And that's exactly what I was trying to do. So I said, I'll come up with the money. I'll come up with the translators. I'm putting a challenge right here. Next year, every conference, when you refer to your field work in India, I will want a camera there and you guys interacting with those people, those guys talking back. 
and that is where this whole idea of purva paksha i thought the purva paksha should be done by the community that you are studying that you are publishing let them say that this guy is full of nonsense that whatever he's saying is crap you know you let him say that he has a right to say that because you may be you may be full of nonsense so i was kind of a uh, troublemaker uh, in all these kind of uh, ways and uh, so the this went on i mean i could give you hundreds of examples of interventions and uh, trouble making uh, and it became clear that uh, it was a bad idea for me to keep funding them and funding them in very large quantity uh, we funded university of california we funded uh, harvard we funded university of texas uh, uh, at austin and on and on princeton university we funded so uh, i at some point in time decided that you know i'm going to i'm going to stop funding because i'm having all these arguments with these people and one of the uh, so so i was building a theory of a framework you know it's one thing to just experience a lot of problems uh you like you can have a lot of patience of various kinds but it's it, the real research is to come up with a framework come up with a thesis come up with a model come up with a model which is a predictive model an explanatory model you know a model the way you are looking for what cause is what effect what is the cause what is the effect like a theory of causation you need to have a theory of causation like we have in physics i mean you can keep observing different episodes of eclipse but you need to come up with a theoretical model of why there is eclipse how it happens how to predict the next one or you could have a you could observe high tide and low tide but you but the breakthrough comes when you build a model so i wanted to build models that's what i do that's what i've done ever since i want to build a model of how the studies happen why they happen a certain way our side of it how it operates their side of it how it operates that's what really gets you into uh, making uh, idea coming up with frameworks like hindu phobia that what goes into it it's years and years of hands on encounters facing them in their own in their own home territory like going to the harvards or the chicago's university of chicago's type places and facing room full of people where i'm the only guy speaking a certain way and they're all of a different point of view it takes courage and and you put your neck on the line you stick your neck out and then you over a period of time you become better and better and they realize that you know you're not going to be easily defeated and that's how you become strong and that's the kshatriyata it's built through actual encounters and actual battlefields and it is not a copy paste sitting at home and writing some paper here and there and becoming important and doing a tv channel or something like that it is not that's not how you can do it so the the discovery that a large amount of abuse of hinduism was happening because of the use of a lens called freudian psychoanalysis and this was university of chicago uh, was the champion wendy doniger was the chief she was at one time the president of the american academy of religion very big title uh, she was uh, then then diana eck at harvard also she was the president of the american academy of religion the american academy of religion is sort of like like in, for physicians there would be some physicians association and there would be tie tie for tech people like that it is the apex body in the world for religious studies and there are 12 13000 members and they come every year for an annual conference somewhere in the united states uh, from all over the world they come so it's a very big deal uh, and i presented papers there i present i had conf- i had panels where i was the hindu speaker the only practicing hindu speaker often in these panels would be me and they were all people who had got all this and that degree but they are not representing the tradition they were representing some point of view from some lens or something they studied So Wendy Doniger was the prime the the number one in in promoting the study of Hinduism through the lens of Freudian psychoanalysis and those of you who know Freud thought, thought that everything uh, if you dig beneath the surface there is a sexuality involved in every repressed suppressed hidden sexuality in how you behave and how you worship and why you do have this symbol so she ke- her she and she had this thing called a toolkit we have it now another kind of a toolkit that you guys are familiar with but this was wendy doniger's term toolkit she had developed for using freudian psychoanalysis to analyze hinduism the gurus the Ram, sri ramakrishna vivekanand uh, shiva krishna uh, you know the goddess you name it everything was put under this freudian psychoanalysis so there would be a certain uh, student 
getting a PhD from her. She had produced almost 100 PhDs on Hinduism of this kind. <clears throat> so a certain student might study the goddess. Somebody else might study a ritual of some kind. You know, what's the hidden meaning of this? Is it male oppression? Is it caste oppression? Is it sexual repression? Uh, is it some sexual deviance? Uh, what are they? What In other words, always looking for these hidden meanings that Hindus would never accept. Hindus would never accept this as a bona fide, valid point of view. But she was looking for things that Hindus would deny that would really upset Hindus because she thought that's what we are. We are the doctors and looking at your symptoms and we'll tell you what's wrong with you. We'll come up with an interpretation that you will deny because you don't want to admit it. But that's our job. She was openly say that the anger that Hindus may give you is part of the job of the scholar that you have to put up with it because that's what Hindus will do since they don't want to admit all these things. So they, she was training this huge army. So I, that was my beginning of formulating a, theory, a whole thesis that this is Hindu phobia. Now, I did not start out dec a decade earlier in all of this with an idea saying there is Hindu phobia. I never had this term. And the term came about in my life. Uh, there was a professor, Akbar Ahmed, a Pakistani high commissioner. He was the Pakistani high commissioner in London uh, from you know, Pakistani. When he retired, uh, he got a uh, visiting professorship at Princeton University. So I, we got to know each other because uh, he was very, very nice guy, very friendly guy. We became very good friends. And from Princeton, he moved to American University in Washington. And he would call me every year to address his class as the Hindu speaker. And I would come and teach, talk to his class about everything I felt like talking. And he was very nice, very, very nice guy. So in this friendship, one day he says, you know, come, uh, come to my, uh, uh, this event in Princeton University. I said, well, what is this event? She says, we are giving the, we are giving the annual book award for, uh, exposing Hindu, uh, for exposing Islamophobia. So I said, what the heck is that? I mean, I'd never heard of it. I mean, I, we are going back 30 years now. So he said, Islamophobia is a term that I've started. And he claimed that he started this. Uh, he used to be in the UK and then he was in Princeton. That Islamophobia is a term and then he described that, you know, disliking Islam and hating Islam, thinking it's dangerous, it's an evil, whatever, whatever it is that Islamophobia is. So I, so I, that's when I thought that, you know, if you are complaining all these things about the way they're treating Islam, we got a problem with Hinduism too. And I had given him a lot of examples. So in that car ride, I said, you know, if there is Islamophobia, then we should also be doing this same kind of work to expose Hinduphobia. And then I looked up online, I did a quick search and the, the Islamophobia had tens of thousands of hits. People writing about it, arguing about it. Uh, it was a topic of conversation. And Hindu phobia got zero hits. So I said, you know what? I'm going to start using this term. And that's how I started using this term. And this became popular. <laughs> now, this is all online. There's a, we had a, a Google Yahoo group. We have had many uh, online things uh, that document this sort of thing that started. Now, the thing is that the first reaction from our own people was not favorable. I mean, I have, a, I have a, uh, an email from a gentleman who was very senior in the VHP uh, saying that I don't see there is any problem. I go to America and when we go there, the temples are doing very well. We have 800 temples and they are making a lot of money. Our, our Hindus have got large houses, big cars, and they got good jobs. He didn't realize that Hindu phobia is in the academic world. It's not in the, they don't come inside the temple and stop you from praying. I mean, he didn't really understand. The, he, the guy is totally out of context. So when I brought it to the attention of the major gurus in India, they didn't want to touch it. It was too controversial. They didn't want to touch it. They said, you know, we'll go teach them yoga and meditation and it'll all be fine. Uh, it's like saying that, uh, you know, go to your enemy and just give him a box of mangoes and candy and sweets and he'll be fine. I mean, it's so stupid to, to think like that. And these are the people who are protectors of our tradition. So the, the, uh, this uh, 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 starting of Hindu phobia uh, had a, it, it was a rough start for me because our own people were not interested, were not willing to, uh, you know, get on with this. It, it's not like, uh, you know, a whole lot of people were already interested or very soon got interested. That was not it. It, it took a lot of battles. Uh, one of the big turning points was that there was an exhibition in uh, 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 an, an exhibit in 
uh, Washington DC in one of the museums, some special exhibit on Indian carving, Indian art and so on. And in that, uh, the, the uh, Shiva, the statue and the, the Shivaling had a Wendy Doniger interpretation that uh, this is what it is, that this is what it represents. And the, the interpretation of, uh, uh, you know, Ganesh as a limp phallus uh, from Wendy Doniger was the interpretation. So when I found out about it, I informed uh, some of the people who were into, who were the, you know, uh, VHP people and people involved in Hindu organizations. They drove, they took uh, one of these guys, he sat in a car, two or three of them, they drove to Washington and they saw this for themselves and they got very, very angry. And that was a kind of a turning point because now they could see that this is, hap hap uh, this is an insult, outside insult. And then I, uh, one of the things our foundation gave a gift of huge number of books to local a private school, a very prestigious private school uh, called Princeton Day School. I took the teachers to India for religious exposure and teaching them about India live. We used to take 20 students every spring break to India to teach them about uh, Hindu culture in, in India. So I, we gifted them this library of books and I gave them a list of uh, what we are going to send. And the professor there, the teacher, Hindu, the, uh, this white guy, he was a very friendly guy, uh, the teacher of religion, he calls me and says, you know, Rajiv, I have to see you because there's something sensitive. Some people are complaining and I need to tell you. So I went and had a coffee with him. And he said that this list uh, includes uh, books, uh, books about Sri Ramakrishna. I said, yeah, what's wrong with that? He says, no, no, we have the such and such scholar has written that Ramakrishna was a pedophile and he abused uh, Vivekananda. And uh, uh, the, this Jeffrey Kripal has written this book and so on. I said, but that is complete nonsense. So I found out that one of Wendy Doniger's students has in fact written a whole PhD uh, on interpreting Sri Ramakrishna as a pedophile, as a sexual deviant. And when he used arguments like he in some place he, he invites Vivekananda, come sit on my lap. He says that was a sexual advance. It was a homosexual advance. And then he says that uh, uh, this uh, the way Krishna stands with his, uh, he called it cocked hip standing out. That's a homosexual offer. So these are the kind of things that these people are writing. So it is, this was great for me to show our people that you guys better wake up. This is nonsense and you guys better wake up. So you see, I went through all this. And this thing called Hindu phobia keeps evolving. So some people come up every five years, there are some new people who suddenly enter this field and they suddenly discover it. They suddenly discover it and they discover a different example and they think that they've discovered something new. But it is not that they've just suddenly discovered Hindu phobia. It's just that Hindu phobia has so many manifestations, so many forms and it keeps evolving. Now there is wokeism as a new form. So, I mean, I could start by saying that, hey, I just discovered Hindu phobia in the form of wokeism. But the point is, it's a new incarnation. The Hindu phobia has existed for a long time. And when we, if we claim to write the history of Hindu phobia or to do a treatise on Hindu phobia, we have to start from the very beginning when it was discovered, how it was discovered, who discovered it, what was, what were all those incidents that we went through. You cannot just put them aside and say, hey, it's some new thing I just discovered yesterday. So this is part of the problem of our side, not being well educated about the scholarship that has happened from our side before and suddenly discovering something like a new, a kid has discovered something new and claiming that it is something fresh and original. And we have a lot of such people. So Hindu phobia is a, is a, is a topic that's been around at least 30 years. You know, and now it's also true. Somebody tells me that there's nothing new you did because someone in the 1800s used the term. That may be somebody in the 1800s used the term, but they didn't use the term uh, referring to Freudian psychoanalysis because there's no Freud. Freud didn't exist. It wasn't referring to the same syndrome that we're talking about. It may have meant something else. So Hindu phobia, as I refer to it, and I have a book that called yeah, Academic Hindu Phobia, Academic Hindu Phobia. It's a reprint of an earlier book called Invading the Sacred. Invading the Sacred was a book that came out 25, 20 some years ago, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, then we reprinted it under the name Academic Hindu Phobia. So our use of the term 
refer to particular doctrines, particular lenses, particular methodologies that result in a certain kind of output about Hinduism. Uh, and that methodology is what we call Hindu phobia. So people who use that methodology we call, and produce those kind of results, we're referring to them as Hindu phobia. And there are many more methodologies now coming out. I mean, but they are all with the same kind of a motive. So that's sort of a, a bird's eye view of, uh, uh, you know, the background on Hindu phobia. Now, I want to uh, discuss two things, two more things. Uh, how much time is there left? Okay, good. I'll give 10 minutes each on these two books. So, this is a book called Ten Heads of Ravan, a critique of Hindu phobic scholars. Uh, now, actually, Ravan has got thousands of heads right now. They're all over. You have them in Oxford also. You have them in Cambridge and you have them in Soas and you got them all over the place. You got some in the parliament also, I'm sure. So, uh, we just pick 10. And the reason, uh, and, and Ravan is used as a metaphor because Ravan was a very hardworking, brilliant man, very, uh, a very scholarly person, a very scholarly person, a kind of a pandit in the true sense. The word pandit is now used very loosely, but pandit actually means a scholar of texts. A pandit has to be an expert on some texts. A pandit of Ram, uh, Ramayana or a pandit of Mahabharata or pandit of, uh, you know, Vedas. A pandit has to, is not, is a title you are given after you have proven your expertise in certain texts. So he was a pandit of a very high standard and a meditator, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of Shiva and had a lot of boons and a lot of powers. So he's not a dumb guy. He's a, but he was twisted in the way he applied that brilliance. And so we are using the term Ravan. Uh, in metaphorically to refer to intellectuals today who we consider to be very brilliant, very hardworking. We don't deny that. But they are working in ways that is not in the best interest of the Hindu community. That is our definition of, of uh, Ravan. So, uh, the just, the, the, just before COVID, I think that last year was 2019, I think, the last year before COVID, uh, around the Shara time, uh, we put out, a, we usually put out some message, you know, Diwali, the share our year end kind of message. So I did a, a three minute, two, three minute animation. I constructed this uh, animation and I gave it to the animator and he made a nice little thing of it. And since it was the share time, uh, I had, I came up with this Ravan with the 10 heads and each head represented, you know, one was Wendy Donegal's head and one was Sheldon Pollock's head and these kind of people. At Audrey Truske's head. So we put him there and then the animation was that each head would start speaking one at a time and start uttering some nonsense against us. Some, and we would put up what the quote, what is that quote. So he, ten, 10 horrible Hindu phobic quotes uh, from 10 different scholars was a way to kind of make a cartoon out of this whole thing. I thought it was just a fun thing, but it really went viral. And so uh, we were having our annual retreat in Rishikesh about that time and we were discussing on what are, what are some future projects and we brought in you know, 20 people of our organization uh, from India, all over India. Uh, so the uh, people were really impressed with this uh, cartoon. It had done very well. So the suggestion was, why don't we turn this theme into a book? And we'll have, we'll have each of those heads a chapter in the book. And so I assigned this to the team of young scholars we have. They are all being mentored by us. They are employed in our organization. And I said, each of you pick one and we'll do, uh, each of you have to write a chapter. And the rules are that the chapter has to be academic quality. You, everything you say has to be substantiated with proper evidence. Uh, you are not smearing or slandering any individual. You are talking only about their work and not about them in their personal life. And so, uh, for instance, Shashi Tharoor, you're not going to say that uh, people accuse him of murdering his wife or something. Because that's not a scholarship. That's not criticizing his scholarship. That's taking a shot at him. We don't want to do that. We want to be serious. So, these, as uh, starting in 2019, this book was published, uh, uh, you know, recently, just this year. So, it's taken this many years because we went through many rounds of, uh, you know, reviews and feedback and things like that. So I'll tell you a little bit of what the, who the people are. These are very brave young people. So 
the romila thapar article is uh, is by anurag sharma uh, young man he's got a btech and mtech and he's working full time for us now he shows that romila thapar has a kind of a soft corner for islam would be an understatement uh, she's she's basically defending islam in india and her 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 uh, toughness and angst is against hindutva uh, and hinduism is somewhere in the middle which is a problem because according to her the aryans brought the aryans brought sanskrit and hinduism to india the aryans and the brahmins are the descendants of the aryans and before that they were dravidians and they were the they were the they were not uh, hindus so this the, the the aryans the reason the aryan invasion theory is problematic for us is that the aryans brought the aryan theory says that they are the ones who brought sanskrit and the vedas and the, and hinduism therefore hinduism is a foreign import brought by invaders so what's wrong if islam also comes as a foreign invader later and christianity also comes as a foreign invader later if you want to stop that conversion you should also finish off hinduism that's also foreign that's the reason the uh, the whole em- political emphasis on the aryan theory is because it's linked to current politics so ramila thapar is critiqued quite substantially then sheldon pollock is by kannan uh, critique and sheldon pollock i wrote a whole book on the battle for sanskrit that book is probably available outside on sheldon pollock's approach to sanskrit a uh, very uh, marxist lens applied to sanskrit and looking at it as in as an oppressive language a uh, language that is against women against dalits against muslims i don't know how he says against muslims they would not know muslims in those days when but he come up with some theory like that uh, so his theory actually is interesting his theory is that ramayan ramayan is the template on how you fight the uh, foreign enemy which is which is uh, ravan because he's sri lanka is outside india so it is it shows god is a role model to fight the foreign enemy god himself is doing it and and therefore the this ramayan became the template according to him uh, to fight uh, muslims because he's a foreign so ramayan is anti islam because it gives you the code the secret code how to go how to how rama how ravan fought uh, how Rav, lord ram fought ravan is how we are supposed to fight the muslims because they are foreign people and this is why this whole ayodhya being ram is important this are th- this is a theory this guy has you know that ramayan is the is the device for anti for islamophobia and then mahabharat is not a battle with foreign people but battle internally within the family the kauravs and the pandavas and so he says mahabharat gives you the code this the how to fight dalits because they're in the family they're within so fighting those who came from outside is ramayan and fighting those who came who are from within is mahabharat so he looks for krishna and whatever is going on he look for some dalits evidence and he says that this is where they get their knowledge from these people are such twisted people uh, so then there is michael witzer whom everybody knows but uh, at harvard he is one of the champions who used the harvard brand name and lot of clout and uh, my money because we funded him for some time uh, to come up with all this aryan invasion theory and archaeological evidence uh, archaeological evidence about the indus uh, indus valley civilization and so on but i must say that michael was also a friend of mine sometimes you take an enemy and you use him and i used him because we were funding him and he was very nice to me so he gave me a lot of dirty linen on his fellow uh, scholars uh, so he is the one who told me a lot of stuff about wendy doniger and where to find it because he was very hard working guy he says these are these are her early writings some of them you may not be knowing about so she, he would expose wendy doniger because they were enemies they were really enemies so in the academic world they are in fighting it's not just hindus who are in fighting and so one sometimes people ask me why are you going to have dinner with michael witzel i'd say because you know i'll get something out of it i'll i'll get something valuable out of it and he was very forthcoming he, he very one of his favorite topics over dinner would be you tell him about different different scholars and he would pick the one he doesn't like he'll tell you so much about them and this is very useful for me so i think it was uh, lenin or stalin who called them, such people useful idiots that you can you can use them 
So, uh, you know, he was a useful idiot for me. Uh, so then there's Devdat Patnaik. Now, Devdat Patnaik in Mumbai, he's important because he writes all these books which are very popular. And uh, Reliance uh, supports him. They, he's on their payroll. He, he, they fund him for all his things. Uh, he, his lens uses postmodernism and Freudian psychoanalysis combined. Now, postmodernism basically says that there is no legitimate grand narrative. All grand narratives are made by the dominant people. They represent power. They're made by powerful people. And the job is to look beneath the surface of a, of a narrative to find out what is the real intention behind the narrative. So the narrative may be just saying something very nice, but there is a hidden meaning. And, and so you have to deconstruct. It's called deconstruction. And the postmodernists learn the art of deconstruction of text. And so uh, they will look for the, the, and then if you combine it with Freudian psychoanalysis, uh, then you, what you are looking for is something sexual. So uh, Devdat Patnaik is a big fan of Wendy Doniger. He always says that. And he has come up with his own mythology, uh, how, how to um, come up with myths uh, uh, that represent all of Hindu culture. And we Hindus don't know it, but he, he knows it. He'll tell, teaching us. So he says even Gita is to be reinterpreted by him and all our deities. And he writes very flowery English, very beautiful. A lot of people like it. But these are hidden messages inside there. So we have him. Then we have Irfan Habib. Irfan Habib is the main guy who gave evidence in the court, legal court, uh, to oppose this Ram Mandir and to support the, the, the argument that... Uh, uh, this is always a mosque. There's no mandir there and nothing. No, So he was a very fiery guy in this. And the other role he played was during Indira Gandhi's time, uh, when Indira Gandhi lost the election and would, could not uh, make a government by herself, she needed a coalition. So she brought in CPM. And Irfan Habib was one of the CPM plants in, in the education ministry. And they, they you see, uh, Lalu Yadav and all that want railway ministry because there's more bribes. So the value of uh, when you're making a coalition government, they're negotiating which ministry who will get based on how much bribe there is in ministries. But the CPM people wanted ideology. They didn't want bribe potential. So they said, we want the education ministry. And we want education ministry. And we will control the curriculum of history and social sociology, political science, all of that. So that is what created problems because Indira Gandhi didn't understand that this is the game. And the, in a generation later, we paid the price. So Irfan Habib was one of the main plants to uh, buy the CPM. The whole left, Ramila Thapar, all these guys came in. Uh, and, and they started uh, reinventing Indian history, right and left, every in every sense. And came up with a very Marxist view of history. So Irfan Habib is solidly anti-Hindu and anti, uh, you know, uh, India in the sense of uh, it, it being Bharat. He views it as a, a Mughal creation, Islamic creation, and that is the greatness of India. So that's a view. Shashi Tharoor is our number six on this list. And Shashi Tharoor says that uh, uh, he likes Hinduism. But he defines Hindu, he says, why am I Hindu? He wrote a book like that. And uh, his idea of Hindu is that you don't me meddle with social political matters. You just stick to yourself. It's all adhyatmic. You meditate, you do yoga, you do some ritual. But then my, arg my counter argument is, if you don't get, if you are not socially engaged, how do you explain the role of Sri Ram? He was socially engaged. He was, he was fighting. How do you explain the role of Sri Krishna? He was involved in the Mahabharata. So the itihas shows the role of avatar as a role model for social engagement, as a role model for kshatriyata. So if, if you are negating that as a part of Hinduism, you're really negating the itihas. Then how are you, how are you, you're truncating Hinduism. So there are a lot of problems with Sachi Tharoor, but being a powerful guy, he's an important uh, head of Ravana. Then we have Audrey Truske, many of you know about it. Uh, her, Audrey Truske is a distinction. Uh, she was a student of both Wendy Doniger and Sheldon Pollock, both. Uh, she did her, th uh, in her dissertation, she lists both of them. And so she's a joint product. And her forte is, uh, her Hindu phobia is through, uh, you know, Aurangzeb as her hero. And Aurangzeb was solving problems because Brahmins were no good. And he was rescuing Dalits. And he was actually very helpful. Uh, it is the Hindu Brahmins who were the, the problem, according to her, 
was Brahmins uh, creating all kind of social gather and Aurangzeb was the good guy. This is sort of what, and she was the one who created this uh, conference to dismantle Hindutva, uh, which became a very big thing. And then we have Ramachandra Guha, who is a kind of Nehruvian, a Nehruvian view of uh, you know, pro-Gandhi Nehru, this sort of a Congress kind of a guy. And again, very supportive. He's not an academic scholar, but he's a scholar, uh, uh, more of a, a kind of a scholar in subaltern studies. He's not a scholar of ancient Indian history, so he relies on, on uh, Ramila Thapar and uh, others like Irfan Habib and Sharma and all these kind of people. Uh, so he packages in a very nice, beautiful language and it has shaped the modern Indian thinkers in a very serious way. And then there's Kancha Ilaya, who famously wrote, Why I'm Not a Hindu. And then he wrote, uh, Post Hindu India, means India after Hindu is gone, Hindus are gone. A very And, you know, Indira Gandhi and all these other people, uh, Manmohan Singh and Rajiv Gandhi, all they patronized these people. They had this minorities commission full of such people. A lot of power, a lot of clout. And I took these guys on. I've, I've had a lot of clashes, a lot of conflicts with them. So, that is, uh, he's uh, number nine. And the tenth is the queen for eroticism, Wendy Doniger. And you already know about her. So, that, so the reason we are doing this is we want to, A, I want to create a next generation of people who are doing my work into the future. I want to encourage them, mentor them. I want to uh, show that, I want. I am telling them that unless you speak up, stick your neck out and write something for which you may be challenged and attacked and you defend yourself, unless you've done that, you're really not up to it. And you can't just do copy paste here and there. You have to do your own work. Run. Uh, so each of these was launched in Delhi and we have videos for every one of these. And we invited the target of target of every chapter to come and give you a response. <laughs> so, so at first the young authors were nervous. They said, Oh, you know, they'll come. Suppose Wendy Donnie will come. Suppose Shashi Thuru will come. What will I do? And I I said, That's what you really want to do. You want that chance. Come on, if you do it, this will make your life, your career. Okay. And you have to just keep your cool and we'll do it. And they accepted it. I said, we send out the invites. So, invites were sent out. Um, and I said, you know what? I'm guessing not one of them will show up. They're not show up because they all get a copy of this. They know what's written. They know no leg to stand on. They are not going to show up. So, sure enough, four or five of them wrote nasty replies that... Who the hell are you? I don't want to, you don't know, you know, kind of insulting. Uh, we are, we've just written very nicely that you are an important scholar and therefore it is important to evaluate you objectively from alternative points of view. And so we have done that and, and, the, and we are publishing a book which uh, shows you as one of the top 10 scholars that is worth investigating. And so we would like to invite you to give a response. And you will be allowed to speak without any interruption. You will be allowed to, uh, nobody will monitor, will filter you. You can say anything you want. And so here's what we are writing. And so half of them were very upset and the other half chose to ignore. So none of them showed up. And we have all this, the proceedings of our 10 events uh, are on video. And we, we brought our own uh, senior people. Uh, so we brought senior people to give commentary on for, for these young scholars who've, did, who've done this work. And now, I have them working on two new projects. Not only these people, more people. And one of them is on is a very groundbreaking, completely different take on how to tackle the caste controversy. We're going to take it on, big way. But we have come up with... <laughs> so, you know, we have already come up with a small version, a small thing. It's, it's called Varna Jati Caste, a primer on Indian social structures. And you know, yesterday I was having a discussion at King's College, one of the most impressive groups of students, very, really charged up, intelligent, well-read, and I really thoroughly enjoyed that. But before the talk started, somebody whispered in my ear that, you know, there was a move to, uh, uh, to cancel this event. Uh, as too controversial, and uh, one of the uh, one of the ways we got it approved was that uh, they said, "Don't 
let him speak on certain topics like Islamophobia or caste. So I, I said, well, who the hell are they to tell me what to speak on? I mean, this is supposed to be free speech. This is a university. You're supposed to be doing all this stuff. But luckily, they said that a professor, Kshitij Kapoor, who is the principal, supported the idea of you having a chance because of free, free speech. He supports free speech. So I'm very happy. So I made sure I'm talking about caste yesterday. Made sure of that. Because kids must not be... Uh, you know, misled, and they were so happy with this. So, if you uh, if you were to get this book, I'll just give you a quick walking tour. So, you know, in the uh, in the first chapter, what we are talking about is to understand Varna, to understand Indian social structure. You should understand it in the context of the Indian uh, purpose in life. What is the Purusharth? What is the purpose in life? For there are various purposes. So your your purpose could be as a sannyasi. Your purpose could be a purpose could be that you are. So there are different ashrams, different stages in life, and there are different purusharts, different purposes in life. So a sannyasi may have certain purposes. A, a student may have certain purposes. A grihast person may have certain purposes, and you are allowed to have a purpose of uh, fulfilling desires. That's a purpose, but you do it ethically. Uh, everybody is not asked to be a sannyasi and go for moksha. You are. It's not a Moksha, moksha dharma is only one dharma, but there is dharma where you ethically, you have kaam, which is desire, and you have arth, which is wealth creation. That is also allowed, but you do it in an ethical way. So once you understand the matrix, which we have diagrammed here, of what are the different pursuits for different types of people in different stages in life, and the different types of people are the varnas, the different stages in life are there, the different purushats are there, then in that context, the social theory tells you what are what is appropriate behavior for you to achieve your goals for your stage in life. So if you start, if you define the problem the, the way Arishis defined it, that the social theory has to offer solutions for a variety of diverse uh, paths, uh, diverse paths, diverse goals for different kinds of people, that is the premise on which the social the social structure of India has to be studied. That's a very different approach. You cannot apply the idea of a Western concept of what a society is for, what a society is meant to do, and, and try to evaluate the social structure of a system which is based on a different premise. So the premise of Indian society is different. And so we have to apply the Vedic premise to see how this solution stacks up. And then we talk about, uh, I do a comparison between uh, Vedic civilization and Western civilization. It's a table. And we talk about what's the track record been over time. How much diversity has each created? What about sustainability? The sustainability record, the sustainability theory of Vedic culture is very important. And we have to look at that. And what are the different methods and how is resources distributed? And how what are the values and things of that sort? So we are looking, we are before talking, we're not defending caste or opposing caste. We're not into reactive. A lot of people are doing like they react. But we're going further back in time. We're looking at what is the foundation of Indian society. What is our theory of society? We, it's not only a theory of individuals, but theory of society also. So uh, since time is short, I'll just tell you a little bit. So then, you know, the book goes through seven periods of Indian history from early Vedic late Vedic and Itihasic, the Dharmashastra stage, the Muslim rule, European colonial rule, post-independence, and the globalization era. These are the seven stages of Indian society. So we've looked at evidence in each of the seven stages of what was Indian society like, who was suffering, who was not suffering, who was good, how was it compared to Western civilization, Western metrics. So you have to see how has Indian society performed. If you are going to evaluate a system of society, social organization, then you have to see, was this society, social organization working for most people, for most of the time? And the answer is yes, if you look at the evidence. So then we have another, we, as late as 1825, the British surveys, East India Company's own survey on education system in various districts, shows by, by strata, they have Brahmin, Vaishya, Shudra, all these you know, Hindus, Muslims, 
how many percent are in school how many percent are educated what is their quality of life what is their income all the data the east india company was very good at keeping data so we quote from that and uh, uh, Dhar uh, dharmpal did a lot of work on this area and in the until the mid 1800s uh, you know the indian society was pretty good in terms of compared to european society and europeans themselves are saying the average person in india is better fed better clothed better educated than his counterpart in england that that time at that point in time so we talk about a whole lot of these things and then we look at uh, one of the interesting persons and i have to stop because it told me to uh, uh because i also want more time for q and a i really enjoy that you know i go on talking but i like to hear from you and interact one of the things i'll say and then i'll stop is uh, i have a chapter on ambedkar ambedkar because he's the champion of the dalits and so on they quote him but they don't quote him correctly because he wrote four important books one on uh, one on uh, uh, caste and there he had a big fight with gandhi and he wanted to he wanted caste to be reformed and gandhi wanted it to be protected and but you know he was defending caste uh, he wanted it to be reformed but within a within a structure and ambedkar wanted to have the structure dismantled uh, and there's a lot of correspondence letters between the two of them fighting and that pushed ambedkar beyond uh, because he was not into this he had not launched his dalit movement until that fight with gandhi so gandhi has got something to do with it also now he wrote a very scathing book on islam a very scathing book on islam and i'm quoting from that book which the this dalit islam bhai bhai you have to rupture that by bringing ambedkar in and that's what i'm doing here bringing ambedkar as a weapon to you know because they are ambedkarites they call themselves ambedkarites so you got to get a bunch of dalits to chant what ambedkar is saying and ambedkar has written so many things that would be considered islamophobic today he would be declared islamophobic he no nonsense straight forward he is telling you all this stuff about islam and then he writes about buddhism to promote buddhism but his understanding of buddhism is not authentic because his understanding of buddhism is as a social identity but he denies the four noble truths which is the definition of buddhism he says we don't need that he is not promoting the four noble truths nor is he promoting the eightfold path which is the the four noble truths is a diagnostic of the problem the eightfold path is the solution to the problem that is what buddhism 101 tells you and he doesn't want to do that he just wants to use he kind of comes up with his own history of buddha and it's more like a social political side rather than the meditative adhyatmic side so his take on buddhism if you were to go to a regular buddhist uh, and say and forget the, the, his name uh, you know uh, ambedkar name and say these are some statements they are the buddhist and the answer is no and i have uh, many videos we have come out with i have produced where uh, monks of buddhism vietnamese monks and americans and what not uh, if you give them a statement from Uh, ambedkar they say that's not buddhism so there is that issue that has to be taken and then he has a a, a book on karl marx uh, communism so he compares marx and buddha it's a very interesting book in comparing marx and buddha he prefers Ma buddha he supports buddha and criticizes marx so he's also anti communist so it's very interesting he's anti islam and he's anti communist this guy okay so it's not just he's anti caste he's also anti all these things and i think a study of a detailed study of ambedkar is necessary in your combat against this whole casteism problem that's coming and our people haven't done that i will stop by just saying our team is working on what we think will be a very historic breakthrough a piece of work on caste which we don't we are not wanting to discuss because a lot of people trivialize it then they come up with something silly and think that they've invented it it will be a major work it is not a historical defense like this is a historical defense it's a philosophical defense uh, it also tells you what happened in the british system the role of the british uh, in 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 this caste issue and the role of indian government turning it into a vote banking system the indian constitution turning it into a vote banking system we've discussed all that and that is standard fodder that most people are doing and we wanted to put it together in a readable form and so this is now going to 
uh, many households, many communities in India are getting by the thousand. They're buying this and giving it as a as a teaching tool, as a toolkit, because you can take something from here and it's a toolkit. You can answer back a certain allegation. This is one approach, but we are going deeper and doing something completely different than any of this approach, which should come out next year. Yeah. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you for listening and we'll take questions. Thank you, Rajiv Ji. Please be seated. You know, Rajiv Ji said that he wants to train the next generation. I can see some uh, school and college age kids. Uh, anybody want to sign up? We'll sign you up now and you can take, take him with you. <laughs> Rajiv Ji, thank you so much for those wonderful insights into your books, your work and the background. I hope the audience understands how much time and effort has gone into these books and how much knowledge is in there. So if you're thinking, how can I learn more? The answer is obvious. The books are here, discount prices. Please make sure that you visit the Hindu Sahitya Kendra and get as many as you can. We'll go straight into the question and answer session. The first question that we have is, does caste issue impact us here in the UK and how? What are the triggers which have led to the implementation of the caste bill in America? And what are the top three lessons that we can learn from Hindu Americans to apply here in the UK? So I'll, I'll answer that. And when you ask a question, I'll repeat it for people's benefit, clarify it, and then answer it. So the, uh, there is little evidence that there is discrimination in the United States workforce based on caste because there is race discrimination. If there is discrimination based on any criteria, religion, caste included, there are existing laws, so you really don't need new laws. But there hasn't been any complaint in Harvard or complaint in any of these places where they are making these laws. There's no complaint where a Dalit has come and said, I've been discriminated against. There's no such complaint. So usually you make laws in response to complaints, but there are no consumer complaints. So this people have come up with phony surveys and because of their political connections, they've been able to get these through and get a lot of media coverage. And according to these surveys, uh, um, in the United States, Hindu upper caste are discriminating and oppressing the lower caste. But the evidence is not clear. In fact, many well-established American organizations, not connected with India or Hinduism at all, completely independent, have refuted the statistics that have been presented. But still, this kind of data has gone through. Based on this data, <coughs> Anti-caste uh, lobbies have come up. Legal cases have, have come up. None of them has won. They've all lost. But the, the propaganda is there. And so the lobby has been able to get cities and states and, and uh, government organizations and universities, etc. to come up with new rules classifying caste as a form of race and therefore applying the American racism laws, which are very tough, on caste discrimination. This is going to create a lot of problems for Indians because it will mean that uh, somebody just put an allegation on you because he doesn't like you on caste basis, put an allegation, and then you have to defend yourself as a racist. From You have to defend yourself that you're not a racist. The burden is shifted. Very serious burden is shifted on you. So this is a, this is the, it's a game. The reason what we discovered, you're saying, what are the lessons to be learned? Behind all this is a theory called wokeism, which is the topic of my book, The Snakes in the Ganga. If you really want to understand what is casteism going on right now in the United States, you got to understand wokeism. It's not the same old caste like Risley and all those guys. That was old stuff. It's obsolete. This is a new theory. And this wokeism is an alliance of multiple groups that consider themselves to be grieve, have grievances. So blacks have grievances against whites. Muslims have grievances against other religions. Dalits have grievances against non-Dalits. Uh, LGBTQ have grievances against uh, uh, straight people. 
And there's also a grievous group called FAT. There's FAT studies. You know, there's, in the US, there's a whole discourse called grievous studies. Universities have a department called grievous studies where they promote grievances. So, there is something within that called fat studies where they have fat people saying that we got discrimination against us. There's no medical grounds that fat being ba fat is bad. It's just a made up uh, prejudice against us by people who are thin. So fat is also a category of grievances. <coughs> if you are declared a c group which is uh, which has be which is being oppressed in this manner, then you are called a, a protected class. A protected class is a legal term. And so if you are a protected class, there are all kinds of legal protections against you. One of them is that you can cancel the other people. You can cancel them because they are the dominant culture that are oppressing you. And you have a right to cancel them. They can't cancel you. So it's a very strange kind of a thing. You get special quotas. So I was thinking that if I start a grievance that bald guys wearing glasses have a grievance because we are being prejudiced against. They are people don't like us. And we are discriminated against. Then we'll get a protected class category and we'll get special quota. And, and we'll have real privileges. So, you know, you could just make up any, any kind of grievance if you get enough lobby, enough political people behind you. So this is the, this is the main lesson to be learned is the underlying problem is wokeism, critical race theory. Chapter one of this book, Snakes in the Ganga is a 55, 56 page chapter. Please read that. Don't let the size of the book scare you. Just read certain parts of it. That tells you the, uh, the Americanization of Marxism and the application of Marxism to race, the critical race theory. That becomes critical caste theory and the whole idea of intersectionality, how it works. You should. This is the terminology. If you don't know, if you haven't been using it, then you're already obsolete. So if you want to be a community leader, if you want to be somebody who's a specialist, you cannot afford to not be talking about these things because this is where the action is right now. Thank you, Rajiv Ji. And with your UK tour, you've got so many events happening. You've got so many different engagements happening. How has your experience been this time? Well, I think it's a, this is a phenomenal tour. I mean, my previous tour was also good, but this is even greater. Uh, we're having our uh, parliament talk on, the, on Tuesday, and I have a special special message for the parliamentarians this time, which I won't reveal, but I think uh, we'll see what they say. Uh, but I have uh, I have had two events at Nehru Center, extremely well attended. Uh, one at King's College, uh, several private gatherings, like this morning we had at the Baps Temple and they brought in community. They brought in 20, I was told this is a meeting of 20 most important Hindu leaders uh, in in UK is how I, uh, they were introduced, and and it was an, it was a wonderful meeting, a lot of discussions, and follow up is already happening. They want to do some joint projects, uh, so this is this is very uh, a, 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 di a wide range of topics and themes and audiences, and uh, that I'm really enjoying. I mean, I could spend a lot more time here. Probably I should come more regularly. I would love to have you, sir. Yeah. So despite our spectacular achievements in different fields and our economic success, our economic growth as British Hindus, why are we still not a relevant player in terms of our ability to influence policy in society on issues which affect everyone as a whole community? And how can we create the power to influence on a global scale for the greater good of everyone? So that's been one of the topics of my research for 30 years now, it going on t telling Hindus that you are individualistic, selfish, looking out for yourself and your family. And after you've taken care of that, then you have a community. Maybe the Patels will look after the Patels. The, you know, uh, Malhotras should look after them. All the Malhotras don't look after each other. Uh, uh, but, you know, this community thing is there, which is the Jati structure is there. That is good. But you need, in this society, you need to have global issues. You need to look for bigger things than just your little community. And then there are temples. I'm quite disappointed that the temples are only protecting themselves. And they are not even doing a good job of that. <laughs> Basically, a temple says that uh, if I'm not in trouble, then I better not rock the boat. I don't want to stick my neck out. They'll come after me. Maybe it's better they go after that other fellow. 
and leave me alone. You know, it's almost like that. And I, I have had to, I have, uh, I've had the pleasure of sticking my neck out and defending ISKCON in the United States, Chinmay Mission, and I was telling it to the representative of ISKCON to this morning and the representative of Chinmay Mission and BAPS, and they rep this was right in the BAPS temple. And I've had the opportunity to tell their leaders that they are they are just too, uh, they're not being proactive. They have the money, they have the clout in the American system. <laughs> when I go and want to make the case, the people say, who are you? You're not a clergy, you're not representing a Hindu, you are you're representing yourself, you're a scholar. But who are you? There are plenty of other scholars saying the, you know, saying the opposite. If under the American law of religious freedom and all kinds of things about religious equality and whatnot, if somebody is officially ordained, not some certificate he got somewhere, but somebody has got a big gathering, he's got a well-known organization, he's got a history of followers, there are certain criteria of who is con considered a legitimate Hindu organization or religious organization. One of them is there has to be a house of worship, there has to be congregation, there has to be whole lineage. You know, there have to be a certain number of followers that you have. Otherwise, every cult would say, I am bona fide religion. So, there are so many of these bona fide Hindu religions, all kind of major groups that are there. They have legal rights they are not using. They have the legal right to go challenge these things, fight in court. They, you know, if these big organizations would file lawsuits on bias in the school textbooks, bullying in school, bias in media, bias in all sorts of ways, they have power and they have the resources. They have not wanted to do that until they are attacked and then they go only defending themselves. This is a serious problem. We have a, a Hindu executive, Hindu Mandir executive committee, I have spoken there many times, which is a committee of Hindu executives from various organizations, a few hundred organizations. And they, some trustees, some various people from e representing them join. And we do projects like uh, how to get visas for priests, how to, you know, because priests need a visa, uh, things like how to get insurance policy, uh, how to get security in case you are attacked. So it's all very specific here and there. But I don't see a strategic thinking saying how do we as Hindus, we have arrived here, we are doing very well here. We have a lot to offer the mainstream society and we have a lot to lose and we are losing 50% of our kids because they are marrying outside. I mean, I don't see strategic discussion. And when a Hindu uh, chooses to have a non-Hindu spouse, I've been to some of these uh, temples where some Hindu guys come and he's brought a white girl and they're going to marry and so he wants to ask the priest, you know, to teach her about Hinduism. Now, that's a great opportunity to convert her, to bring her in. The priest doesn't know what to do. He's very embarrassed. He's very sort of uh, awkward. He just does some mumbo jumbo, looks like some voodoo. And it's not a very impressive thing. They're not trained. We don't have training. Now, if you go to a church, in, a, in any seminary, when they, pre, when they graduate somebody to become a priest, uh, you know, one of the courses he takes is how to, how to uh, manage marriages that are mixed so that they become Christian, good Christians. How to help the parents raise good Christian children in a mixed marriage. So the priests are trained how to advise, how to counsel. If somebody, if a Christian is marrying a non-Christian, the parents go to their local priest and the priest knows what, how to at least try. Same is true in Islam. The Muslims have a plan that if a kid, if some child is marrying a non-Muslim, they will take this couple introduce them to some young Muslim couples, other mixed couples who converted, to really be friendly, make it very easy for them, have a social network for them, you know, kind of welcome them, make it nice. We do not have that system. So it's like you're on your own. What do you do? So I think this is lack of leadership on the part of uh, the gurus in a big way. I am happy to say that According to what I can tell, uh, HSS is doing a very good job. They're trying their best. They're doing a good job bringing this together.
Okay, so what we're actually seeing then is more people that are starting to go to dharma, they're starting to look at the culture, they're starting to look at the roots, but yet they are very reluctant to get involved politically. And so why is political activism so important? And what are some of the things that we can start to do to cultivate the sense of interest? So, you know, you should have a Hindu a kind of a media and speaker forum where, uh, like there's a Muslim speaker forum. Uh, if you go online and you need a Muslim speaker in a school or in some social event or some TV debate, you go online to this Muslim speaker forum and they will give you a whole list of speakers. One can speak on uh, environment and one can speak on Islam and sexual relations. One can speak on Islam and, you know, pluralism, all kind of topics. They have different speakers. So somebody has organized them and given all these speakers a voice, a, a platform that they can be marketing themselves. And, and then these speakers are trained and nurtured. So we need something of that sort. And then you need, you need a speaker's forum. And you need a, a legal forum. You need certain for, type of forums that go across the boundaries of different temples and different organizations. All Hindus should be able to get the benefit and participate in a Hindu legal forum, in a Hindu speakers forum, media forum, uh, and so on. And you also need a manifesto. We need a Hindu manifesto, which says these are 10 things. Uh, any politician who wants to get our support, these are the five, 10 things that you have to be able to check off and say, yes, I agree with this. And if you don't agree with this, then we're not going to support you. And you could be a Hindu or you could be a Christian or a Jew or an atheist or a Muslim. We don't care. If you support these things, we will support you. And so in that, you should define very sharply, what you should define very precisely what are the minimum required, uh, what are the minimum required uh, uh, articles of faith that you somebody should have in order to be part of this mechanism. And if you, if you were to put out a manifesto like that, if somebody has drafted one, I would love to participate, help out. I have drafted some such things. But if, if there is an organization that wants to take this forward, I would be happy to help. Fantastic. So the next question is actually an audience question. It says, I have two young missionaries, my late wife's pastor's son and his friend, staying with me in July for three days. Which book should I present to them? The, who are these people, the young people? I think you should give them the book Being Different. Because it is a, it is a debate between, a Purva Paksha between the Hindu side and the Judeo-Christian side. And tells you what's distinct between them. In a nice way, there's no attack, nothing. There's no allegation against anybody. It's just a philosophical analysis of what are the differences. I think they'll enjoy reading it. And the last question is actually a question from the Inside UK team, which is in the space of a scenario. And it says, what do we assert our Hindu identity with pride? How do we do this? A silent Hindu is okay, but an active Hindu who asserts, resists, and seeks agency is not. A proud Hindu who asserts himself is labeled by Hindu-phobic forces as right-wing, sanghi, fascist, nationalist, Hindu nationalist, labels that we've all seen time and time again, and is afraid to challenge this stigmatization. The Hindu starts to doubt themselves, believes in the meaning of these labels and these negative connotations. How can we explain to somebody who is attaching meaning to these labels that they are actually meaningless and hold no substance whatsoever? So basically you're saying how to, how to protect yourself publicly, how to project yourself publicly, how to not be, you know, cow, you know, kind of bullied out of it. This is this comes with experience. I think like we are training a number of uh, intellectual kshatriyas. It is not a classroom thing. I mean, we we I do a workshop, a full day workshop, and then we uh, go through some exercises, and then they we, that's level one kshatriyata, and then level two requires them to go out in the field and take on an issue and fight it and give back and come back with a report. And we give them a whole list of issues that are out there that you have to fight. Some involve media, some involve some school, some involve some politician. Everybody should pick up. I think what you should do is people who come and say, include me, help me join. I think that you should have a list of projects which either one person or a small team can execute within 30 to 90 days 
this should not be a very long term project it could be go and write a report on such and such thing do do a comparison comparative study on how they are treating hinduism and how they are treating islam in such and such context in such and such place do that i mean you need people to get active and start small and start think putting things out uh and and you know once a person claims their identity and you stand up and you say something you then you learn how to defend it because people are going to push back and going to fight you and try to bring you down so this strength comes from actual experience it's not enough to go to like minded meetings when somebody invites me to a like minded meeting i usually reject it i say i don't want to talk to like minded people because what will i learn from them and what do they learn from me whatever i have to say you can read my books and i don't need to sit where listen to listen to the same old stuff you should get out of the safety net and comfort zone of like minded people and go to those who are unlike you and deal with them understand them see what their problems are see what how they react when you say certain things you need to get out of your like minded safety net and that's how you're going to train people to become true kshatriya because unless you can do that you cannot face people in a proper civilized sensible debate and be getting angry and getting emotional is not the solution one of the things that we have to counter that we have to overcome is the tendency in our own people to be under informed and over opinionated and that's a very common thing full of opinions and everything and not very well informed not able to defend something just have an opinion on it and when somebody pushes you uh, pins you down then they get angry that's that sort of mediocrity within our own ranks that we have to confront and it means good leaders uh, and 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 some tough people so you know you need to you need to convince the brightest lot among the young people not the emotional lot who feel that they haven't made it in any other way so they'll become a hindu activist i know people who just put on some hindu uh, you know symbolism and suddenly they have this thing called hindu activist uh, influencer or something like that uh, and when you talk to them they're losers they're really not very impressive and they're really not going to create a, a good impact you need people who are being very successful who want to do this not people who failed and therefore they this is the this this is the last resort so uh, how to how to get people who are very successful and therefore they have the skills the talent the intelligence they can argue they can articulate they, they can they can hold their own they can analyze if you take if you want people like that to join you that only happens when the the person has had an inner transformation it cannot happen any other way as long as the person's inner self is still chasing material things and and chasing success in a common materialistic way and at the ego level it doesn't make any sense for them to give up all of everything and join this kind of a thing it only makes sense to somebody who's had that inner transformation and this is why i say the gurus have a very important role to play because the gurus are in the business of creating inner transformation and part of that inner transformation is they should say or you should go out and serve now gurus offer serve serve seva but that seva is you are in the kitchen you making prasad and or you are looking after the deity and uh, you go and teach uh, you know uh, pranayam those are all very safe non controversial uh, you know seva which we need also but you need to be able to break through this safety requirement and get into sticking your neck out uh, you know take the risk uh, get into something that will be controversial but necessary to do that requires first a transformation and then akshatriyata as as a result of it if you only have kshatriyata without the transformation you'll just be a bombastic egotistical person fighting here and there and make a fool of yourself and bring disrepute to our tradition lot of people are out there yelling screaming becoming violent or angry and all that i distance myself from them because they're just not good to for our tradition to encourage that you have to be calm you have to be well informed you have to have gone through the inner transformation in a serious way Uh, and after you worked upon yourself with the help of a guru or under the guidance of a of an organization uh, then you can 
as a person with that inner achievement you can then go out and be a kshatriya and be a whole new in a whole new level you can be the arjuna out there in the in the field and just do it and few people will be able to stand up to you and and, and bring you down to achieve that is a, a long term process and we need people who are into that that's what i i think we are lacking we are we need uh, we need uh, the pandavas so i i did a piece long years ago, many years ago where are the pandavas where are the pandavas we need the, we need the pandavas there so we need that kind of a uh, individual right now and how to get pandavas you know dronacharya was the major big teacher so dronacharya was a amazing teacher he taught all these guys he taught both sides and so we need the dronacharya to produce these people so i created this thing called uh, uh, diksha academy dharma dronacharya d can stand for dharma or dronacharya intellectual kshatriya academy d i k s h a and so i floated this and i said you support it put it together i i don't need to own anything but i'll be a mentor and so if in the uk or wherever some people have want to create a diksha uh, academy to create the future to be the mentors to create the future uh, pandavas in the next generation so those are the leaders then i am very happy to devote everything i i am capable of to join this process but people have to come forth and want to do this absolutely i would be inclined to agree with you there and members of insight uk we were actually ready for this work that have spent ages preparing themselves mentally physically emotionally what would be your final words of wisdom for them well you know firstly i'm very impressed that insight uk has 400 persons involved at different levels that's pretty impressive and and uh, uh and in the last 3 years so i'm really quite impressed by that because i haven't seen such a rapid uh, and uh, you know growth and the few that i've in, interacted with on a personal level very closely since i came here are extremely dedicated very hard working they're running around like crazy they are project managers and they are good people skills and uh, good good hearted people so i i'm very impressed by this organization and need to learn more about it because i just learned uh, i didn't even know about it until i came here uh so you need such organizations and and i'm glad that you're reaching out to uh the, we had a great meeting with baps this morning and you had people from you had people from all kind of organizations who are successful leaders and you are not trying to uh, oust them or bypass them in fact you want to include them and and that that is a good sign so i would say those of you who have a an interest in going forward and doing something so that you can say i'll commit x hours a week and this is what i'll do i'll say you should join insight and they will guide you and they will move you and then you you will find your place thank you amazing rajiv ji i could actually talk to you all day you've actually given us some real golden nuggets of wisdom there that we can actually go back and apply in our day to day lives so thank you so much thank you all for listening and for coming here And just to remind you all that you will also have the opportunity to engage with Rajiv ji, take photos with him, and take his autograph later on as well. Thank you all for your fantastic questions, and I will hand the stage back to Paris ji. Uh, namaste, Rajiv ji. Um, I begin with a quote from Rig Veda: "Sama namastu vo mana yatha va susahasati," which means, "Let your minds be similar to each other, so so that you may be organized uniformly." so as you can imagine a lot of organized uniformity has gone behind organizing not just this event but the entire uk tour of rajiv ji there are lots of people involved lots of teams and groups involved to make this entire tour a success so we would like to thank all of them and we begin with thanking the hertzwood academy and its management for providing us with this fantastic venue we would also 
like to thank the volunteers who've been serving behind the scenes to make this event and the tour a success. And of course, thank you to the audience for coming here, for taking this opportunity to listen to Rajiv Ji, to interact with him, engage with him. Thank you so much to our donors and sponsors uh, who made this possible. Bharat Bhai Hindota, Thiru Bhai Shah and his family, Kamu Ji and Nitin Bhai Palan and Palan Foundation, Kishore Bhai Dabi, Anil Ji Nene, Shilpa Ben Cheda, Parikshit Ji Sharma, Thank you so much. And to those who want to become a part of this Yagniya Karya, you can go on to the website of Insight UK. There is a link. Um, if you would like to make a donation, a contribution, you're most welcome to. Um, finally, the man himself, the magician, Sri Rajiv Ji, for not just this event, but the entire tour, the Hindu and the Indian diaspora here in Britain can't thank you enough. In fact, uh, there have been repeated requests uh, for you to write a book on snakes in River Thames. So hopefully that is coming, but thank you so much for this interaction and not just these events and the tour, but decades and decades of the work you have done for the community. We can't thank you enough, Rajiv. Thank you so much.